Well, welcome back. It's so good to be back with you this evening. Uh, excited about what God's going to do tonight. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn over to Acts chapter 10 and put your finger there and then turn over to Luke chapter 11. Uh, Want to share just a preliminary thought, but we're going to spend most of our time in Acts chapter 10. Uh, Luke chapter 11 and verse number 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to lead. Is that what your translation says? Let's try it again. Uh, When he finished, um, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to preach. Lord, teach us to start 501c3 nonprofits. Teach us to disciple. No, Lord, teach us to pray. Here's what I believe. When you change the way that you pray, everything changes. Uh, I believe in proclaiming the gospel But if it's not preceded by prayer, I don't think it's going to get very far. You know what? I love to be a great preacher, but uh, far more important than that, that, I want to be someone who has a strong prayer life that lays a foundation in the prayer closet so that God can use me. A a year ago, um, or earlier this year, Uh, I was at the Easter prayer breakfast at the White House. Now, we live 12 blocks from the Capitol. Uh, I'll jog by the Capitol or the White House, I mean, drive by it all the time. And uh, so that's a common occurrence. But going to the White House is, it's a pretty cool deal. You go through security and and you're in there and there's kind of all of this history around you and and. Uh, There are about 200 religious leaders from across the country. I probably had the shortest commute. And so I drove over there, walked in, and and we were going up to the ballroom where heads of state and ambassadors had these, uh, would be entertained, huge portraits of, of George Washington and Martha Washington. And just before the formal program began, uh, they served us breakfast. It was a buffet. And they asked uh, a 67-year-old African-American pastor if he would pray for breakfast. And, and here's the deal. Um, I, I'm on a mission. I, I believe that this generation needs to rediscover what it means to not just pray, but pray through. Uh, we need to rediscover what it means to hold on to the horns of the altar and not let go until God answers. Uh, but we're keeping it real, and so I also believe in short prayers before meals. Because I think it's good stewardship. I think you ought to eat food when it's hot. And so I was kind of expecting one of these, you know, Lord, thank you for the food, let's eat, amen. Um, And that is not what I got. This guy launched into a prayer whose, whose ministry began uh, with Dr. Martin Luther King and, uh, and his pastor at church for many, many decades. He started to pray. I've never heard anything like it in my life. I don't even know how to describe it. Have you ever heard someone pray with such a familiarity with the Heavenly Father that there's just almost this sense of conviction mixed with, oh man, I want to know God the way that they know God. That they seem to be so close to God that you kind of want to get close to them because you think that's the way to get close to God. He pray- It was like his prayers were deep fried in the faithfulness of God. Um. I think faith is a byproduct simply of God's faithfulness, and that's why I think the longer you follow Jesus, you ought to have a lot more faith because God proves himself faithful over and over. And and that was this prayer, just this familiarity, like, 
Like he was talking to the creator of the universe, but the creator was his best friend. And then you would think, I mean, I'm thinking it's just a buffet breakfast, and certainly, I mean, there's secret service. It's certainly not poisoned or anything like that. But if it was, I think, it, I think we were covered. Because um, it, it was like he just walked out of the throne room. I'm like, this is a meal. And, and just prayed with this authority. He knew he was a child of his heavenly father. And so when he said amen at the end of this prayer, I turned to two friends who were next to me. Um, Andy Stanley, who pastors a church in Atlanta, Georgia. And then uh, Louis Giglio, who started the passion movement. And I turned to Andy and Louis and I said, you guys, I feel like I've never prayed before. I wonder if that's how the disciples felt when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. I mean, they'd been praying their entire lives, but they had never heard someone pray the way that Jesus prayed. I, I wonder if tonight, could, could we just kind of say, Lord, teach us to pray? Could, could we kind of collectively do that? In fact, could we just say it together? Lord, teach us to pray. I, I, let me just ask the question, make sure we're on a level playing field. Is there, is there anybody here? And, uh, you know, I know in our video venues too, you, you can raise. How, how many of you feel like just this past year, like you have just prayed too much? Yeah, I've never, I've never had a hand go up or your prayers are just too effective. Answered immediately every time. I've never met anybody that feels like their prayer life is what it could be or should be. And yet in the same breath, I mean, I want to tell you that I think prayer is spelled potential and potential is spelled prayer. I just don't think that your proclaiming or preaching or discipling or leading can ever go beyond your prayer life in terms of its supernatural effectiveness. And so I wonder if tonight we could say, Lord, teach us to pray. And what I want to talk about is what happens when two people pray. Not real complicated. Let's find out. Acts chapter 10 is where we're going to spend our time together. Verse number one. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need. And then here's the little statement in my Bible that's underlined. And he prayed to God regularly. Okay. That's all I need to know. That's all that has to be on your, your resume. Like, this tells me everything I need to know about Cornelius. Here is someone who was seeking God's face. Now, we don't know when or where or how. Don't know if, you know, did he kneel and pray? Did he do prayer walks? Um, no idea. But what we do know is that he prayed to God regularly. If you're taking notes, jot this down. When you pray to God regularly... Irregular things will happen on a regular basis. The more I pray, the more coincidences happen. And I don't believe those coincidences are coincidences. They're providences. They're, they're God both creating the opportunities around me, but also creating within me the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to recognize those opportunities. Uh, about five months ago, I got a phone call from a member of Congress. Doesn't, doesn't happen very often. In fact, I was a little nervous at first, like, did I do something wrong? And kind of curious, he said, I want to get together with you. And, and I said, well, great, like, can I come to you? And he said, no, let me come over to your coffee house. And so on a Wednesday morning, we sat down, and uh, I had coffee with this member of Congress. And, you know, I, I was curious about his story, like, how do you become a congressman? And, uh, and he told me his story. Uh, in, in 2007, he was directing the largest Christian camp in the country, preaching on the weekends, living the dream, loving life, 
doing exactly what he thought he would do the rest of his life. And that's when one day he just kind of sensed in his, um, in his prayer time that, that the Holy Spirit said, get ready. Now, he said, I didn't even know exactly what that meant, but he said for several months I just felt like God was about to do something and I just got this sense, like get ready for what God's gonna do. And he said, one morning I, I was reading the, the newspaper and I'm flipping through and I come to this article uh, about uh, the congresswoman who represented our district that she was gonna run for governor and and that would leave an empty seat in Congress. And he said, that's when the Holy Spirit said, this is it. He's thinking to himself, this is what? I mean, not a political bone in his body, no network, no resources, didn't even know the boundaries of his congressional district. He and his wife had never talked about it. And so he goes on the computer, and he's researching county statistics. When his wife comes in and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm looking at county statistics. And she says, we're running for Congress, aren't we? Okay, here's the problem. There's no way this guy's gonna win. Like, but that's not what God had called him to do. Called him to run. And so he threw his hat in the ring and a couple of months before the election, the front runner dropped out of the race. The next thing you know, he's elected uh, to the United States Congress and is now serving his second uh, term. And he said, I, I wanted to just come over and say thank you. He said, when, when I felt like, like God was calling me to run, he said, I thought I had lost it. He said, I thought I was crazy. And he said, a friend of mine gave me a book that you wrote. It's the second book I wrote called Wild Goose Chase. It's a book about the Holy Spirit in a sentence. I don't know how else to say this. I hope this is okay. The Holy Spirit is crazy. And so um, if it's not crazy, like I don't, I'm like wonder anymore if God's even in it. Um, but if God is in it, then it's wholly crazy. And he said, I, I read that book and it just kind of, it, it gave me the confidence that I needed to, to go for it. And he said, I just wanted to come over um, since we're in the same town and say thank you. And, and then this is pretty cool. He said, uh, I just read The Circle Maker. And he said, um, you might like to know that this congressman is circling his congressional building every day that Congress is in session. He said, I am circling our office building, praying for my constituents, my colleagues in our country. How awesome is that? See, here's the deal. Let me let you into my world. Um, I'm not a guy with, with high levels of self-confidence, um, but my holy confidence is off the charts. I just, I, I live with this holy anticipation that God can show up at any moment and change everything. I, I'm just a guy that believes God can do more in one day than we can accomplish in a lifetime. I just take him at his word. Okay, I mean, here's the way, listen, if God created the universe with four words, let there be light, by the way, um, that, that, I mean, astronomers have discovered galaxies. I mean, the last I heard was like 15.5 billion light years away. But according to the Doppler effect, I mean, there's still galaxies being created on the fringe of the universe. And so those four words are still creating galaxies right now. Four words! Okay, if God can do that with four words, and, and then in the meantime, keep the planets in orbit, like... You think he can an handle your stuff? I think he can handle our stuff. Uh, God is sovereign. And, uh, and so I love these next two words. Are you ready? Oh, these are two of my favorite words in the Bible. Are you ready? Oh, let this get in your spirit. Here it is. One day. Oh, I love this. Why? Because today could be the day. Like, today could be the day 
that God shows up in your life the way that God showed up in Cornelius' life. I mean, here's a guy that was just praying regularly to God, hitting his knees in the prayer closet, seeking God's face. And one day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. Distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear and said, what is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. And we say, big deal. Why? Because Joppa and Caesarea are 32 miles apart. 32 miles, big deal. No, huge deal, because in the first century BC, the average person never traveled outside a 30 mile radius of their birthplace. Do you see what I'm saying? This is God saying to Cornelius, I want you to leave your universe. What do you do in those moments? I mean, besides that, like if I'm Cornelius, I'm saying, wait, you want me to go where to meet who, who's called what, who's staying with who, where? Like, do you not, do you not want more than this to go on? See, I want God to reveal the second step before I take the first step. But if you aren't obedient to the revelation that God has given you, if you don't take the first step, that second step may never be revealed. By the way, everybody take a deep breath, let it out. God wants you to get where God wants you to go more than you want to get where God wants you to go. And he's awfully good at getting us there. Don't walk out and say, oh man, how do I pull a Cornelius deal and like find my Joppa and like, you know, get there and, you know what? No, you seek God and God's going to get you where you need to go. What, what do you do when you feel those crazy promptings? Um, I told you about Ebenezer's coffee house, right? Um, l- let me tell you a little bit of backstory. And I'll make it, I'll make it quick. Um, when we first started out as a church, the, the church office was a spare bedroom in our row house on Capitol Hill. And, and then um, we already had Parker, who's now 17, and, and Summer's now 15. But right when she was born, um, the second bedroom, which was the, the church office, became her bedroom at night. I would set up a porta crib and unplug the church phone. And then in the morning, I'd fold up the porta crib, plug in the church phone, and it was my office. Now, the commute was awesome, but it just got real old real fast. So we were looking for a church office, a place where we could, you know, do what we do. And and two times, I I was sure that I found the place, and I let God know. And, And I was like, God, this is it. And and in both instances, as we went to put a, a contract on those two different properties, in both cases, the morning that we went to do it, we discovered that a contract had been put on them the night before. Now, have you ever had God not only not answer a prayer, but give you like the anti-answer? I mean, it's frustrating and sometimes it's disillusioning, like, God, you just did the opposite of what I was praying for. Um, By the way, two full litmus test. You can circle things all you want, but it better be in the will of God and for the glory of God. God is not a genie in a bottle, and your wish is not his command. His command better be your wish. It's all about his kingdom. And so you got to be praying the will of God for the glory of God, but when you do, you can pray with some authority. But you know what? Sometimes you're going to swing and miss. I want to tell you that my prayer batting average is no better than anybody else's. But I'm determined to keep getting into the batter's box and swinging for the fences. I mean, what's my other option? Not praying? And so I'm going to keep praying and praying through. And so 
God didn't answer those prayers, and I was so frustrated. And so one day I'm walking home from Union Station. I'm just walking down F Street. We've got letters and numbers and presidents and states in D.C. And I'm walking down F Street, and I walk in front of, there's the crack house, which is now our coffee house, but right next to it, and we didn't own that yet. In fact, the idea for the coffee house wasn't even an idea yet. But right next to it was this row house, and when I walked by, I felt the strangest prompting. Um, I had met the owner one time a year before. I'm not great with names, but I could, could swear that the name Robert Thomas popped into my mind and just this impression should, that I should call him. Now, what, what didn't make sense is that there was no for sale sign. There was no indication at all. Like, and I'm thinking, like, God, why would I even do that? I'm going to feel like a fool. I'm going to say, hey, this is Mark Batterson. What's up? I don't know why I'm calling you. But th- this was uh, you know, pre-Google, and so I went home, and there were these things called white pages. And I found his name. Uh, there were actually eight Robert Thomases. I was almost, almost like eeny, meeny, miny, moe. But I'm like, I think this, let's try it. Dial the phone number. Someone picks up. I said, hey, is this Robert Thomas? Yes. Uh, this is Mark Batterson. I don't know if you remember, we met about a year ago. Uh, I pastor the church that meets in Union Station, and, and, um, and he interrupts me. And this is what he says. I was just thinking about you. He said, I, I was thinking about putting my row house on the market, and, and I just had this thought that maybe you might be interested in purchasing it, but I didn't know how to get a hold of you. Now, that's when you're pretty sure that God's up to something. And, and so I said, let me pray about it, yes. <laughs> and, and we bought that row house, but, but here's the deal. Then what did we do? Oh, man, we started to go in. We started to lay hands on the walls of that row house that abutted the crack house on the other side. And we started to pray that God would give it to us. And and that's exactly what God did. And so now here we have this coffee house, you know, net profit going to missions. Um, God's blessing it. Um, But it traces back to one little prompting of the Holy Spirit. Now again. You don't have to live in fear that you're going to miss it. God's good at getting our attention, and God is all about second, third, and a hundred chances. But I think there are moments that make us or break us, and it's those moments when in prayer we really discern the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and we try to figure out what God's calling us to do. And when we're obedient to those prompts, it's game on. Then it becomes this adventure. Now, you're always going to get it right? No. You're going to still make some mistakes. You're still going to fall down sometimes. Sometimes you're going to still feel pretty foolish. But then you never know what can happen next. Okay, here's where we are. Right now, we've got one person praying. His name is Cornelius. What happens when two people pray? Let's find out verse number nine. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray, became hungry, wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, fell into a trance. Saw heaven open, something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. Contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And I love verse 14. Surely not, Lord, Okay, I think we have some of the faculty here from, you know, the theology departments. I'm pretty sure that when you call someone Lord, the two words that cannot precede that are surely not. <laughs> it's a contradiction in terms. Um, I, 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 but you got to love Peter, right? Like everybody needs someone in their life that makes them feel good about themselves just by comparing yourself to that person. Um, you know, like Peter's that guy, um, like, okay, all right, you can mess up and God can still use you and that's encouraging. And so, but, but I get it. I mean, why, why is Peter resisting this? Because Jewish dietary law. I mean, he, he would never think of eating an unclean animal. I mean, it, it would have been breaking the, the law. Now, 
Now, I, I want to tell you that God's never going to tell you to do something that, that's outside the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God as revealed in this book. That, that's just off limits. But there are going to be moments where God's going to take you beyond your experience, beyond where you've been, You can't tell me that there aren't gifts that God wants to give you and exercise through you that that you haven't experienced yet. You you can't tell me that there aren't. See, here's the catch 22. All of us want God to do something new, but then we want to keep doing the same old thing. But it doesn't work that way. You got to do something different. Sometimes you've got to allow God to just do something new in your life, and you know what? It may just be practicing a spiritual discipline in a new way. I mean, in the last year, fasting has become huge for me. I mean, it's the hardest spiritual discipline for me to practice for one very simple reason. I like food. I like eating. And, and fasting is hard, but I've found that as I've practiced that spiritual discipline in a new way, that God's begun to do some new things in my life. And so here's Peter kind of in this moment where God gives him a vision, and, and he's like, surely not, Lord. Yeah, how many of you have ever gotten in an argument with God? Let me see your hands. Yeah, where, where the will of God didn't quite add up. Here's what I've learned, and this is kind of the key point tonight. If you get into an argument with God, if you win that argument, you lose. And if you lose that argument, you win. Some of you here tonight need to lose an argument with God. You're saying, surely not, Lord. But you know that God's doing something in your heart. You know that that something needs to change. Need to stop doing something, start doing something. Need to take a step of faith. There is something that God is, and you need to lose that argument. If you were to lose that argument, it would change your life. Uh, that first year um, that, that our church was up and running, um, we didn't have anybody lead worship. And so, like, that was me. And the only thing that's worse than my voice is my rhythm. And we didn't have a drummer. And every weekend it was like our worship, it was not a joyful sound. I don't know what it was, but it, it wasn't pretty. And so um, for months we were praying, God, send us a drummer, send us a drummer. Like it was like the number one national community church prayer. God, send us a drummer. Like we need a drummer. And, and kept praying that over. And I, I, bet, I bet 150 times we prayed, God, send us a drummer. And, and then one day, it was the strangest thing. I felt like God said, well, why don't you go out and buy a drum set? My reaction to this, why don't you send us a drummer? (laughs) I want God to go first. Why? Because then it doesn't require any faith at all. See, I want signs preceding. The last two words of Mark's gospel are signs following. Some of us are wondering, well, like, why is God not moving as we stand still? Like, and if you were to make a move, if you were to step into that Jordan River, God might just part that river and lead you through to, to one of his promises. But you have got to step out in faith. And so after a long argument with God, I decided I'm going to lose this argument. I said, God, I don't think it's good stewardship. I'm going to go get the drum set anyways. Um, and so I found a used drum set up in Silver Spring, Maryland. I drove up there on a Thursday. The entire time I'm thinking, I, I can't even explain this. Like, this is crazy. Uh, again, $2,000 was our total income, 1600 to rent the school. Anybody want to guess how much the drum set was? Yeah, 400 bucks. And, and I remember thinking, this is crazy. And, and, but I felt that prompting. And so bought the drum set, brought it back. Now listen to me, God doesn't always answer this quickly, but that Sunday, kid walks in, clean cut, and in D.C., you can tell, you can tell, I mean, what branch of military is it? And uh, Marine Corps, uh, 
Eighth and I, you ready for this? Drum and bugle corps. Okay, we have a simple rule in our church. If you play for the president, you can be on our worship band. Like, God didn't just send us a drummer, he sent us a rock star. You know what, sometimes God shows up and sometimes God shows off. And, and I love it when God shows off. And it was like God's way of saying, Mark, keep taking those little steps of faith. Keep taking those steps of faith and allow me to, to come through and, and show you what I can do. And so Peter's having this vision and, and, uh, and here's what happens. Um, the voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. And, and then... Uh, Verse 16, this happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Now, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, okay, and you can kind of see this divine appointment about to happen, um, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was, stopped at the gate, called out, asked if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Okay, what would be the big deal about Peter going with them? Well, the only thing more unthinkable than eating an unclean animal would be to violate this, this law of, of then associating with someone who was unclean, a Gentile. See, at this point, the way, as it was known, was a sect of Judaism. It was a Jewish thing. There were no Gentile believers. And, and so... It was unthinkable. In fact, it was against the law for Peter to go with him. And, and you see, if you know biblical history, he's called on the carpet. The council at Jerusalem like, calls him in and is like, what were you thinking? And, and then when he explains, and we'll see what happens, um, that changes the game. But there are moments in life where you have to be willing to risk your reputation in order to establish God's reputation. And this is that moment for Peter. He risks his career as an apostle by going with these Gentiles to go to Cornelius' homes. But I want to show you what happens. We're going to end uh, with these couple of verses, and then I have a closing thought that I think um, might make your day. Verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. Uh, bless you. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. And then here's the, the last little phrase. And, uh, and we're gonna end with this thought. Are you ready? As Peter entered the house, no one gasped. Let, let's try it again. As Peter entered the house, that was really good. Um, I've never done that before. Okay, here's what I want you to see. Like, entering a house, like, big deal. I mean, I've entered lots of houses. Like, what? No, this is more than just entering a house. This is a threshold. This is a portal. What I want you to see is that in terms of church history, this is the signing of the Declaration of Independence. This is planting the flag on the moon. This is the wardrobe in Chronicles of Narnia. This is the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. This is what I call the door to whosoever. Why? Because at this point, Jewish thing, but the very moment, the split second that Peter enters the house, are you ready? Whosoever will may come. And the gospel is thrown open to everybody. What happens? Cornelius and his household are saved and baptized. And as they say, the rest is history. But here's what I want you to see. Two people praying. Divine appointment. Obviously, Cornelius is an answer to that prayer. He saved his entire household. But let me ask you. Is this a prayer that was answered one time in one person's life? 
Or is it possible that this is a prayer that was answered billions of times, in fact, answered in your life if you aren't Jewish? See, if you're here tonight and you are not Jewish, you are a Gentile, you can't get saved if Cornelius doesn't get saved. This is the moment that opens the gospel to every. So here's what I'm saying. What I've just revealed to you is your spiritual genealogy. If these two people aren't praying, you aren't here tonight. It was these two people praying that gave them this sensitivity of the Holy Spirit, allowed the Spirit of God to orchestrate this unbelievable divine appointment that changes history because the gospel is open to everybody and you're here tonight because of it. One final thought. Peter and Cornelius should have never met. Ever, never, ever. Italian soldiers and Jewish disciples don't hang out. So you know what? If you meet with God, God will make sure you meet who you need to meet when you need to meet them. And I mean that whether I'm preaching to our church of 70% single 20-somethings that are looking for someone to spend the rest of their life with. But I also mean it in an occupational sense that it is who you know especially in our town in Washington, D.C. And you know what? It's awesome when you know someone who knows everyone. That's awesome because it's one degree of separation, and God will make sure you meet who you need to meet when you need to meet them. But you meet with God. You seek God, and God's going to take care of it. I have one last story that I want to share with you, and, uh, and then we're done. I love testimonies. Revelation 12 says that we overcome uh, the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. I think testimonies are powerful things. They, uh, they uh, I think we've got to steward them and share those stories. And so, you know, in writing books, one of the great joys is uh, hearing stories from people who have read one of them. And, and uh, so let me share one of those with you. It was probably um, four months ago that I got an email from uh, a man, coincidentally, named Peter. And uh, Peter said, hey, I, I just had this experience. I had to send you a note and tell you about it. He said, I was reading your book, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day, which is the first book I wrote about six years ago. And he said, um, I was reading it on a flight to Las Vegas. And he said, you kind of, kick me on the back of the lap because it's a book about chasing lines about living proactively like we worry too much about sins of commission what about the sins of omission what we would have could have and should have done you can do you can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right goodness is not the absence of badness not about holding the fort let's make a difference let's allow God to work through us he said I, I was reading the first chapter And he was like, man, I was like, God, where is the opportunity? And so he said, I got on the second leg of the flight from Phoenix to Vegas. He said, a girl sat down next to me, and I just felt like it was more than a seat assignment. I felt like it was a divine assignment. And so he said, I turned and introduced myself, and the truth is, he said, she shut me down. You ever been on a flight, like, and someone, like, you know, he said, I I told her my name, and she was like, Kind of like, you know, that's okay, but don't ever talk to me again in the armrest is mine kind of deal. Just like kind of shut it down. Like, I do not want to talk to you. But a couple of minutes later, he, was, he just couldn't resist the prompting. He was like, man, I, I don't want to offend you in any way, but I just, I feel like you're carrying a burden. And if sharing that with a complete stranger would help, then I am all ears. And this 17-year-old girl unloaded on him three months pregnant, uh, on a plane to Vegas because uh, her boyfriend told her to take off and take care of it. She had stolen her parents' credit card that morning to purchase a one-way ticket. They had no idea where she was or where she was going. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, but it seems to me like one, maybe two lives are in jeopardy. And as she shares her story Peter begins to share the grace of God. There's a God who's bigger than any mistake we've made, that there's a God who loves us and cares for us. Man, by the time they land in Vegas, instead of her getting off of that plane and running away from home, 
she gets on the phone and calls her parents who are worried sick. Her parents say, sweetie, we love you. We're going to walk. We're going to help you. Come home. And she gets right back on an airplane and she flies back uh, to Phoenix. And that night, Peter gets a text message um, from her that just says, thank you. Now, I don't know if they have kept in touch. And, and I, I don't want to play like, you know, counterfactual theorists necessarily. Like, I, I, I don't, but, but by my calculation, this baby is due probably in a month or two. And I can't help but wonder if that mother will share this story with her son or daughter. I, I don't know, but whether she does or not, you tell me, does that baby have a spiritual genealogy that includes a man by the name of Peter who should have never met his or her mom? That's crazy. These are two people who should have never met and yet one divine encounter changed the trajectory of this girl's life and that baby's life. What I'm saying is all bets are off. You just never know. When you pray to God regularly, irregular things will happen on a regular basis and it's not your job to manufacture them. It's your job to recognize them and seize those opportunities and make a difference. So Peter closed his email and said, that's what happened after chapter one. Can't wait to read chapter two. <laughs> I want to pray for you. Uh, but before I do, one last closing story. I do like two or three conclusions in our church so our church doesn't get all that excited. I, I know I'm two minutes over time, but I'm the one who's flying red eye back to DC tonight. Quit complaining. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't share this one last story with you. Um, so I wrote this book, The Circle Maker, and it's a book on prayer. And, uh, I don't in any way feel like I have prayer figured out, but um, when I heard this story, it's, it's a story that I wanted to share and one that I think in closing will inspire you. In the first century BC, there was a drought in Israel, a drought that threatened to destroy a nation and a generation. And, and the truth is, you know from history that kind of this intertestamental period, like there weren't prophets, people, there weren't miracles, there weren't hearing God, but there was one man that believed that God could still hear them. His name was Honey the Circle Maker, and what's curious about him, now Josephus in his writing refers to him as Onias the Rainmaker, but the same person. What's interesting is that almost like the prophet Elijah, he just had the faith to pray for rain. And so the people of Israel sought him out, brought him into the temple courts and said, uh, will you pray? And here's what he did. He took his staff and he put it on the ground and he began to turn. And he turned all the way around until he stood within this circle that he had drawn. And then he knelt down in that circle and he prayed this prayer. Sovereign Lord, I swear before your great name that I will not leave this circle until you have mercy upon your children. That's a bold prayer. If God doesn't answer that prayer, someone's gonna look foolish. Someone's gonna be in that circle a long time true legend, started to rain. People start to rejoice. Not Honey, he's still kneeling in his circle and he says, not for such rain have I prayed, but for the rain that will fill pits and caverns and cisterns. And the heavens opened. In fact, the people had to flee to the Temple Mount because of flash floods. Honey's still kneeling in his circle. He says, not for such rain have I prayed but for the reign of your favor and blessing and graciousness. It began to rain and 
perfect moderation. Here's what happened, and then we're done. The Sanhedrin wanted to excommunicate him. Shocking, right? (laughs) Wanted to do the same thing to Jesus after he healed a withered arm because it was on the Sabbath. Okay, by the way, Jesus could have done that any day of the week. I think he chose the Sabbath because he just knew it would be more fun. <laughs> but you can't argue with a miracle. I love this. And so in the historical records, Honey the Circle Maker was honored. Are you ready for this? For the prayer that saved a generation. I'm a simpleton. You are one prayer away from a totally different life. I believe in the power of prayer. Prayer is the difference between the possible and impossible. Prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. Prayer is the difference between you fighting for God and God fighting for you. How many want God fighting for you? Let's pray. God, we humble ourselves before you tonight, Lord, we draw a circle in this place, and we bow our hearts before you and say, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. God, let your glory be unveiled, let your power be unleashed in us. God, let your grace and mercy Flood our hearts and minds and souls so that we swim in your goodness and your greatness. God, we want to see you move in our generation. God, we want to see you do amazing things. So in these next few moments, we consecrate ourselves to you. God, as we worship you, we do not want to give you lip service. Lord, thank you. It's not the quality of our voice. It's not even the words that you hear as much as you hear our hearts. So Lord, help us tonight to worship you in spirit and in truth as we lift our voices and lift our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.